So if we want to look specifically at the human population, we can see here on this graph of human population growth that for a very long time, the human population actually uh, struggled a bit, if you will, to increase in population size. There's a lot of different things uh, that prevented the human population from growing to any real large extent, but it started to increase uh, more rapidly due to different innovations such as tool usage uh, early on, then agriculture, and eventually things like industrialization. Um, as we started to understand how disease was spread, how we improved medical care, all of those things led to what has now become a very rapid population growth. And one of the ways to kind of see how quickly this happens is to look at how fast we move, um, how, how fast we gain an additional billion individuals. So you can see over here, it took, you know, obviously a, a very long time to hit 1 billion. Then it took about 150 years to reach 3 billion. Um, but then after that, it only took about 12 years to go from 5 to 6 billion. And then another 12 years from 6 billion to 7 billion. Um, so it's, it's happened rather quickly. Uh, one thing I can say is just in my own lifetime, when I was born, and you can look this up based off your birth date um, on certain kind of um, models for the human population, is when I was born, it was the human population was 3.5 billion, and we're now, you know, above 6.7 billion. So it's more than doubled the global population just in my lifetime. Uh, now, when you look at how fast the human population is growing globally, it's not uniform. Um, just like so many other things that, that we'll talk about is it's just not a uniform rate of growth here. And you can see, for example, uh, percent growth in the population represented by these different colors. And in some cases, you actually have uh, negative growth rates in some areas um, that basically you're getting fewer children are being born than adults dying. Uh, you have some that are basically leveling off. So for example, the U.S. is largely leveling off. As a matter of fact, they just recently released uh, statistics that said we're now at a 0.48% growth rate here. So we're pretty close to zero now um, in the U.S., one of the things you'll find in countries like the U.S., Europe, Japan, etc., is actually it'll be immigration that causes us to um, not go into negative or potentially stay positive in growth rate, not so much uh, birth rate in a given country. One thing to keep in mind is where you know we might where we're going to see the the significant increase in population size over the next you know ten fifty. Uh, potentially 100 years, are in the countries that are in this, you know, 2%, 3% growth rates. So, you know, you can really see here the continent of Africa has a lot of different countries that are in this 2 to 3% growth rate. And that may not seem like a lot, you know, 2%, 3% doesn't seem like much. So sometimes a, a useful way to look at this is what we call the doubling time. So if you look over here on the left, uh, the doubling time, there's an equation that it's more complicated than this, but basically it works out to uh, if you just take the number 70 and divide it by the growth rate in percentage, so in this case using a 2% per year growth rate, 70 divided by that number gives you the number of years for the, for the population to double. So if you think about that, if you had a 100 million people in a country that has a 2% growth rate, in 35 years, you're going to have 200 million people, a literal doubling of the population. And 35 years is not that long a period of time. So this is of great concern globally is where you're seeing these kind of major areas of rapid population growth. And not only for the, the impacts in terms of overall global population size, but also for the countries that are specifically growing at this rate. Uh, so you can see here some of the predictions coming from the United Nations of what population size is, is predicted to, to do over time. 
you can see here again this is you know starting in 2015 of about 7.3 billion we're actually at about 7.6 or so now by 2050 we're already at 9.7 and then the prediction is is we may literally go or likely go above 11 billion by 2100 and that by itself is substantial if you look at where we are now versus where we're heading um you know just by mid century adding another you know, 2.3, 2.4 billion people to the planet. I mean, that right there is adding another China and India, basically on top of what we already have. And then in essence, doing that again, um, between 2050 and 2100. That by itself is challenging. But here's where I really want you to look at is look at Africa. I remember we were talking about Africa there, you know, a little bit over a billion here, but look where they predicted to be by 2100. I mean, you're looking at, you know, at the very least, more than a tripling, almost a quadrupling of population size in a relatively short period of time. Um, there is population growth, obviously, in some other areas, but you can see, for example, Europe is actually going down. Um, if you look at, you know, where they are now versus where they're predicted to be. Latin America and the Caribbean is going up, but not by a great deal. Uh, North America is going up. Um, chances are what you're seeing there is actually more immigration than you are seeing birth rates. Oceania is small to begin with, so even though it nearly doubles, its impact is relatively small. Asia um, goes up and then actually starts to decline again, and so you're seeing probably the impacts of countries like China and India slowing down their growth rates. But it really is, you know, Africa here is of some of the greatest concern globally, and in part, that's because of the specific impact to the countries that are growing that quickly, not just on the global impact of that larger number of people, but how will individual African countries deal with a rapid population growth like that? So if you look overall, though, what you're actually seeing is this is trends in total fertility rate. And so what's, what this means is fertility rate is basically the number of children born per female. And... It dramatically, of course, that's what's going to impact population growth in a given region. And you can see it's broken down here. We have the world in blue. So following this line here. And one thing to keep in mind is, is it is going down. So population is growing globally, but growing at a decreasing rate, which is good. I mean, when you look at the population growth curves, um, like what we did uh, before, what that basically means is, you know, we've, we're doing this growth here and we're in this area where it's starting to slow down. And the idea is, is where exactly is it going to level off? Is it going to kind of keep growing a little bit, leveling off high? Is it going to level off more quickly or could it potentially even go down? And the key thing to keep in mind here, though, of course, is in essence, what we've got is right in here with fertility rate. If a pair, right, a, a mother and a father, leave behind two offspring, then they're replacing themselves. And that would be basically growth rate equals zero. Anything above that, and you're going to have a potentially a positive growth rate for the population. So again, here's Africa in yellow. You see that staying above two um, well into mid-century and, and probably further that's what's driving that population growth. It may be growing at a slower rate um, overall, but it's still growing and growing enough that it's going to add a significant number of individuals um, each and every generation. So what are the key things that slow this growth rate, that start to decrease that total fertility rate? And again, it's a little harder to see here, but you can kind of see it on this graph, total fertility rate. And one of the you know things that people following this, demographers, people that study populations, uh, what they do is they look at what are the, the critical things that cause populations to increase and decrease. And some of the things they've, they've noticed, some of the things they've figured out is one of the key aspects, interestingly, is this decreased infant mortality. And we'll talk about this again when we talk about demographic transition. But the idea here is if you actually decrease infant mortality, and you might think that's counterintuitive, you say, well, if fewer infants are dying, doesn't that mean population would go up, not down? But what this triggers is, is a decreased need to have more children. 
So women choose, families choose to have fewer children because initially one of the uh, motivations to have a large family size is because of the high infant mortality rate. So women were having more children in order to kind of account for the fact that one or more of them will not survive. But if you decrease that infant mortality rate, then they actually decrease that motivation and fewer of them uh, will be born because they're not trying to hedge their bets. Another aspect is this higher education and personal freedom. And again, key for women. Um, so that's what you're actually seeing over here is this percent of girls enrolled in secondary school. If you look at that across, you know, in countries around the world, what you see is as women have more and more opportunity outside the home and are no longer just expected to have children and stay at home, they can do other things. They're motivated to actually have fewer children so that they can go to school, they can have a job. Um, one of the aspects that tends to also drive that is this kind of overall um, movement from rural to urban. And the idea there is when you're in a rural population and you're farming, for example, having a large family uh, may be beneficial and you may not have access to things like education or other types of employment. But as you become more urban, as people move into cities, now having the larger number of children is less of a benefit. You don't have a farm to be taken care of. Uh, education may be really important and you also potentially have other opportunities for employment. And so that tends to also help drive this decline in fertility rates. So these, you know, these are, these are key aspects in here. And then finally, you have to give families, give women access to birth control to be able to make the choice so that if they are continued, continuing to be sexually active, that that sexual activity doesn't automatically result or increasingly result in pregnancy. So if you decrease the infant mortality, decreasing that kind of demand or that motivation to have more children to account for those that don't survive, if you give women greater power, greater influence in society, uh, the greater chance to do something other than um, have children, for example, for uh, education, employment, and you give them the tools they need to avoid pregnancy, then these all, all of these components um, tend to result in this decreased fertility rate. So in essence, we just talked a little bit about the human population um, and its growth. And so it's one thing that, you know, we, we have to decide at some point as a, as a society um, where this number is going to end up, you know, whether or not we're going to end up, you know, at 11 plus, oops, sorry, decrease that, 11 plus billion, um, or if we, you know, maybe can slow that down to, um, you know, 9 to 10 billion, or if uh, we actually find a way to decrease fertility rates and decline to a point that, you know, is maybe below um, you know, or less than, you know, eight or, or so billion. Uh, a lot of that's going to be determined by some of the things we just talked about and whether or not countries going through this process are able to actually slow down their uh, population growth rates and decrease their total fertility rates. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about this issue of the demographic transition.